please allow me to introduce Michael L. Thurman, who is the Chief Executive Officer of DeKalb County, Georgia, which is one of the largest and most diverse counties in the Southeastern United States. He is also an attorney, author, and motivational speaker. Thurman's book, Freedom, Georgia's Anti-Slavery Heritage, 1733 to 1865, was awarded the prestigious Georgia Historical Society's Lila Hawks Hawes Award. And in 2004, the Georgia Center for the Book listed Freedom as one of the 25 books all Georgians should read. CEO Thurman, a sharecropper's son, holds a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Religion from Payne College and a Juris Doctor degree from the University of South Carolina's School of Law. Thurman also completed the Political Executives Program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He earned the reputation of being a turnaround expert after transforming the culture and operations of the Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services, the Georgia Department of Labor, and the DeKalb County School District. In 1986, Thurman became the first African-American elected to the Georgia General Assembly from athens Clark County since Reconstruction. In 1998, he was elected Georgia Labor Commissioner, becoming one of the first African-Americans to be elected to statewide office in Georgia. He was also recently named Georgia Library Champion of the Year by the Georgia Public Library System for his work with the DeKalb County Public Library. Please, everyone, help me in welcoming Michael Thurman. First of all, let me thank our uh, Georgia Archives. Let's give them a round of applause. I am a great supporter, long standing. And when I came to the Georgia General Assembly many, many years ago, one of the first places I visited and came to appreciate and really began some of this research that our state archives was located there on the Capitol complex. Uh, delighted to have so many friends of long standing. Uh, first in that group, a young man who covered me throughout most of my political career. Uh, you all would know him as the uh, chief, uh, chief reporter in the political realm for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Uh, the legendary Jim Galloway. So give me a round of applause. And he and I have been on this journey. Uh, one of the first articles written uh, about uh, Overthorpe and my research, uh, he wrote it. You know, he and I share a love for Georgia history. He just delighted to be with so many people uh, on standing. I mentioned Mr. Killian, uh, who won uh, the gift today, Mr. Killian family. And my family have been decades and decades long friends over the years. So good to see you. Now, James Overthorpe. Oh, man. So I won't tell you about the book because I want y'all to buy the book. So I won't. <laughs> so I'm not going to read from the book. But I'll tell you how this book came to be. And I began October 7th, 1996. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> October 7, 1996. I am a member of a 57 person delegation of Georgia elected officials, business leaders, educators, citizens, private citizens. And we had journeyed to England to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the birth. Of James Oldham. Hmm. And the delegation was being led by former Governor Zell Miller. How the heck did I end up in England, October 7th, at the Paris Church of All Saints in the village of Cranham, located about 19 miles northeast of London? I'm there. Go back two years before that in 1994. Uh, and my wife, Zola, get Zola here, she's here. <laughs> Our daughter is four years old <laughs> at that point. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Governor Miller called me one day uh, after I had run for Congress and lost 
He called me and asked me if I wanted to become director of the Department of Family and Children Services, DFAC. And anybody who knows anything about Georgia politics is that's where careers and reputations go to die. Right? <laughs> DFAC. Uh, Zola didn't want me to take the job, right? But, you know, I had lost a race and I'm in political exile, so I take the, take the job. And right after I took the job, Newt Gingrich and the new Republican majority in the House in Washington come up with the social contract. And there's this movement to reform welfare. So I'm the de facto director running all the welfare systems in the state of Georgia. And all of a sudden, after more than half a century, people in Washington come up with the idea to reform welfare. Perfect. <laughs> for me. Yeah, at that point, you know, uh, welfare recipients and the welfare system has become the, the focus of all types of criticism and almost hatred. And it was a very politically charged environment. So in the process of creating a back-to-work strategy uh, for Georgia, I remember something from my seventh grade social studies class. That James Overthorpe created Georgia to give impoverished, unemployed British citizens better, what, a second chance, and he transported the poor, unemployed debtors to Georgia to get them to work so they could support themselves and their family. James Overthorpe became our patron saint. I hung his photograph, his portrait, in every defax office across the state. We adopted the original model. Who remember what the original model is for Georgia? Now it's wisdom, justice, and moderation. What was the original model for Georgia? That is non cb said Ali. Translated means not for self, but for others. That was the original model for Georgia. Not for self, but for others. And the 21 trustees, including Overthorpe, chose that model because he felt that number one, unlike all the other 12 British American colleges, this would not be a for-profit venture. Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you know, uh, Rhode Island, all of those other colonies, Virginia, were for-profit operations. Georgia is the only one that was for non-profit. And so their motto was not for self, but for others. And they were forbidden to generate or receive any profit from this venture. And the one way that Overthorpe in particular wanted to ensure that the trustees would not become self-serving and, 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 and attracted or intoxicated by the potential of wealth is that he and the trustees chose to prohibit chattel slavery in Georgia. Consequently, Georgia of the so-called 13 original colonies, Georgia is the only one where slavery was prohibited. And if you, someone asked you a fill in the blank question and said, just pick one, pick one colony where slavery was prohibited prior to the Revolutionary War, how many people would have picked Georgia? No, why not? I see my friend would have, but for those who didn't know better, who, why, why would you not suspect that Georgia would be the colony? Because Georgia had slaves like other slave states. Yeah, it's just not part of the reputation, is it? At all. And growing up in Georgia, going to school in Georgia, I had no idea. So why is it that you think all of the people in this room who are obviously very intelligent and smart and engaged, otherwise you wouldn't be here lunching and learning today, these are smart people. Why is it that you would not have been suspecting that Georgia would have been that college? As smart as you are, as well read as you are, most of you all are history buffs. How could that information have escaped you? Not in the school curriculum. Not in the school curriculum. 
Give me, give me a hand. I love that. That's a great answer. Not in the school curriculum. That seemed to be pretty significant, right? All things being equal, why would that not have been in the school? The people that wrote the school curriculum didn't care. Didn't care? Is it in the school curriculum? No. 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 Or college. Or college. That's pretty long. Well, the belief is that it, it didn't last very long, at least in Georgia. And since I want to talk to you about the arc of history. It lasted from officially from 1735 to 1751. How many years is that? Somebody do the math. I'm a boy. I can't do this. 16 years. So it didn't last relatively very long, but how long did the Confederacy last? Is that in your history, in your curriculum? <laughs> <laughs> so, with these eyes, it didn't last that long. The Confederacy only lasted, what? Four years. But it's omnipresent. It's everywhere. Something is happening here. That Buffalo Springfield, who sung that song? Who? The hit in the 60s. Come on, somebody else. <laughs> right, who remember? If something happened in here, what it is, what? It ain't exactly clear, but something's happening here. So, James Oglethorpe, let's go back to him. The prohibition against slavery, and I'll stop. I got about five more minutes, and then we can just talk didn't just happen. It wasn't organic. It didn't just happen. This man fought to make it happen. Of the 21 trustees, he was the only one to live in Georgia. His colleagues stayed in England where it was safe and secure because in 1733, Georgia was a prehistoric wilderness. Your life hung in the balance on every day. There were disease. Uh, there were Hostile native Indians that were colonial powers fighting for control of the Southeast United States. That was Spain and Florida. That was France and Louisiana and that what became Louisiana and Alabama. It was just a constant struggle. That was disease and, 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 and petulance and all these things. This man, in the midst of all that, said no to the enslavement of black people. Father George. There's no, what, how, at a point in time when the enslavement of people was like breathing air on every continent, it was accepted. It was generally believed, particularly that black people in particular were not what? People. They were not people. They were not human. It, de facto and de, de jure, <laughs> through law and through custom, black people were property. And they were bought and sold like animals in the field. Christians believed that black people were not human. Consequently, they did not possess redeemable souls. And because of that, they should not be Christianized. They should not be educated. But they were, in fact, property. But James Ogilvie, this man in the midst of this, says what? No. That's not true. But true. And so my book is about how this man, who started out, by the way, working for a slave trading company called the Royal African Company. He was the deputy governor of the Royal African Company. He moves from being a slave trader to one of the first white men in North America to speak out against slavery. And ultimately, I believe, and I think facts will show it, breathe life into what became the formal abolitionist movement. What triggered it was this man. A Yuval Diallo, 
Diallo. His name is Diallo. D-I-A-L-L-O. On February 1730, he was sold into slavery by his enemies. He was transported to the colony of Maryland. He was enslaved on a tobacco plantation, attempted to escape. He was captured. But he convinced the tobacco plantation owner who had him enslaved to allow him to write a letter. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. He was highly educated. He was fluent in Arabic and other African languages. Those of you know African history know that some of the first universities were established where? Yeah. In Africa. About 15% of the 12.5 million Africans that were captured and brought to America and to the Caribbean were Muslim. He wrote this letter in Arabic, enslaved in Maryland, no UPS, no U.S. Postal Service, <laughs> with the intent that the letter be transported back to his father in Africa to acquaint him of his dire predicament and hopefully to help affect the rescue. This letter travels through the hands of several white men from Maryland to 4,000 miles back to England. The letter, once it gets to England, is placed in the possession of this man, James Oberdorf. But the letter is written in Arabic, so Oberdorf couldn't read it. He sends the letter to Oxford University. There is a professor of Arabic studies who translates the letter. Oberdorf was so affected by the contents of the letter that he writes the owner of this man in Maryland, purchases his freedom, pays for his passage back to England. The Allo arrives in England. Now, have I got British friends? British, any British folk? <laughs> All right, I, yes, yes. My daughter lives in England. Lives in England. <laughs> you, 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 you born in England. British folk are different. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're very different, right? So he gets to England, he becomes LeBron James, Michael Jackson. He did it all in one. He becomes what they call, described as a roaring lion of British society. He ends up having dinner with the king and queen. Ultimately, is free and returns to West Africa. Senegal. What he did was for the British uh, subjects, and particularly for the elites, he was one of the first black person, black people they inter ever interacted with. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we possess bias and prejudice about people, and one of the main reasons we have bias and prejudice about different people is what? Right. No, it actually, you don't know. Yes, sir. Did he influence British stopping the slave trade? Well, what he did, he set things in motion because of who he was and because all of a sudden people were like, wait a minute, these are human beings. He helped give birth to the anti-slavery movement. And consequently, instead of animals, now you're talking about enslaving millions of human beings. Oberthorpe, by doing what he did, set this process in motion to your point, and this is the long arc of history. This was in 1733. Britain abolishes slavery in what year? 1830, a hundred years later. One of the things that I encourage, one of the things I enjoy is not just looking at historical events, but examining the event that led up to mm -hmm. yeah, what I call prehistory. So what Overthorpe was really about when you study him is that he had a huge influence on the prehistory of abolition as well as anti-slavery. 
that he has never received credit for. And the main reason he never received credit for it, so if you're in Georgia in 1733, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, New Jersey, all the other colonies got slaves, and here you are saying what? No slaves. So are you going to be very popular or are you going to be despised? <laughs> Despised and hated. I mean, every afternoon at six o'clock on Fox News, they were wearing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. So basically, that's what's going on, right? They they had the worst negative campaign, political campaign ever concocted. You know what they? Do the politicians because they knew that if we erode his reputation and authority, get him out of the way of what can happen. He can get slaves into Georgia. Eventually, they won after those 10 years. They won in July 1743. Oglethorpe was run out of Georgia, back to England to face court martial. For 19 charges, including treason, which if convicted, you are punishable by what? Yeah. Man. Yeah. And also to potential financial ruin because he invested huge sum of money into the colony, but the parliament wouldn't reimburse him because pro-slavery Georgians had smeared his reputation. <clears throat> Luckily, he was acquitted of all charges, got his money, and never came back to Georgia. He died, and I'll stop believing that his experiment or his desire to prohibit slavery in Georgia had what? Failed because it had lasted, what, just a short period of time. What history teaches me, though, is that we have to step back. Step back. Oglethorpe envisioned and dreamed of a slave-free Georgia. Georgia we live in today is what? A slave-free Georgia. Historically, the event that I point to first is that in December 1864, on, I think it was December 24, a Union general named William Tecumseh Sherman Show back up in Savannah. Slavery was dead, and Oglethorpe's dream was redeemed, and because he had a desire and a hope to create a state where all people are free, only people you benefit from the labor of your own work, where diversity is encouraged, that's the Georgia we live in today. That's James Oglethorpe. He didn't fail. He succeeded. And because he succeeded, we are so, so, so blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Michael, you have lost your mind. Tell me more. <laughs> yes, I'm ma'am. intrigued by this whole concept. I'm a graduate of Oberthorpe University. This is not in the narrative at all about James Oglethorpe. I study, I minored in history there. Oh, wow. Mm. And not at all. Nothing. Not a word. His, 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 his portrait looms large in the Great Hall. Not a word. Not a part of the narrative where James Oglethorpe is concerned, even in his namesake university that's touted as being one of the top universities. In the state, I'm intrigued by this concept. When is the book coming out? <laughs> Where is the book? <laughs> it will be out uh, next the 15th. When is the 15th? Next week. Next week. Yeah, next week. And uh, just between us, you know, I got to just oh, make man. sure I got a copy. You know, a little bit of a copy. It's coming. But let even better than you. I am. The keynote speaker for Oberthorpe Days at Oberthorpe <laughs> University. <laughs> and I am so looking forward to going on. Uh, Eli Arnold 
who is the uh, yeah. yeah. Let me quote you what Eli Earl wrote okay. as a blurb in my book. Okay. Eli Earl, the uh, library director of Overthorpe University. James Overthorpe's effect on the abolitionist movement is succinctly and convincingly proven in James Overthorpe, father of Georgia. I believe this book will initiate a reevaluation of both Overthorpe's and Georgia's important role in both the anti-slavery and abolition movement. Mr. Eli Owen. And it will. And it will. And For it's sure. so important. For sure. Because he is the librarian yes. at Overthorpe University. Yes. For him to have said that, yes. and I appreciate him so much. All right. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So how did Overthorpe and what I knew or what I had learned about Overthorpe impact my work at DFAT? Is that was that the question? Tremendous because all of a sudden I felt like as DFAT director, we were carrying on the original vision for Georgia, which is to give impoverished, unemployed individuals a second chance to earn self-sufficiency here in our state. Overthorpe came from a very wealthy family. He attended Oxford. You know, they were they were not nobility, but they were right there at supporting the nobility. But he recognized that we should be a state that was concerned about those less fortunate. When he was in Parliament, uh, you all remember that in the early 1800s, you could be placed in prison if you could not pay your bill. And England, jail prisons were overflowing and they were um, just infected with corruption. And Oglethorpe passed legislation that allowed for the release of 10,000 debtor prisoners from British prison. The problem was that if you're poor in prison and all of a sudden you release, all of a sudden you're what? On the street, poor, Homeless. Each time I see homeless people living on the bridges in the cab all around, I think about over there. And so he decided, look, I just can't get people out of prison who are poor. I have to create a place or a strategy to help them find jobs and income so that they can support themselves and their family. And that was the motivation for creating a 13 colony between South Carolina and Spanish-controlled Florida, which was Georgia. So, but let me tell you who it influenced more than me. And I talk about it in the introduction. So I'm working for Governor Zell Miller, you know, Governor Miller had a reputation of being what? Very conservative, right? So his plan for reform and welfare, and Jim Galloway knows about it. He all tough love, he was very draconian, uh, just to punish people uh, off of welfare uh, into job. That's what he wanted to do. I didn't want to do that. I thought that if you give people uh, child care, transitional Medicaid, job training, that poor people are uh, given the opportunity to work to support themselves and their families. All you have to do is provide some support other than welfare. And I disagree, but I came up, I thought of something. Who was the leader? of the delegation that took us to England. I told you, it was who? Zell mm -hmm. Miller. He loved James Overthorpe. But one day I was in the governor's office. I said, Governor, uh, James Overthorpe would approach this differently. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, we would sit down for hours talking about James Overthorpe. So we came up with a strategy called Work First, a welfare reform without the meanness. Mm -hmm. You can help people, but you don't have to be what? Mean. Yeah. And therefore, we invested tens of millions of dollars. Uh, we helped in the end 90,000 families uh, move from welfare to work by being supportive and, and not punitive. And so it affected me, but 
But most importantly, it impacted the guy that made the ultimate decision, which was Governor Bell. It's, a, it's an Oglethorpe County adjacent to Clark County where you grew up. Yes, sir. I grew up there. All I knew was it's Oglethorpe County, but I never knew anything else about it until I listened to you. Did that affect you in getting involved with Oglethorpe? Well, I, yes. Uh, I grew up, my, at least my home, I didn't grow up there, but for the last 40 years uh, in Athens, the, the cone of Oglethorpe and Sunset. <laughs> I've been on this street, and uh, it did. I, I passed through Oglethorpe yesterday coming from uh, Augusta. And I was thinking about that uh, and how I just think this is going to help us. I think it's going to help us. But someone asked me, why is this even important? So what? I think it will help us better understand who we are and help us pursue, as Lincoln talked about, our better angel. Because we were founded by a man who loved people who saw beyond race and legal status and was not afraid to pursue a more inclusive and I think positive agenda uh, here on the most difficult of circumstances. I just think as Georgians, we should be proud of that and we ought to celebrate that. And you know, think about it. And I'm just being honest here. Right now, the big history wars that are taking place, it's a fight, right? And it's, it's mean and it's nasty. And it's full of invictus. I believe that here is a person, here's a history that can put, help people come together as opposed to tear us apart. Yes, ma'am. My concern is uh, history being taught in the educational system nowadays. Um, you, I, I, I'm not from Georgia, but I've learned a lot of history from different states, and that was not one mm -hmm. of something that was even mentioned. I never knew who Overthorpe was until I moved here. So it's just not uh, him, but a lot of history in our educational system, education system that needs to be learned because we learn from history. And there, there should be some way that that can be introduced. I mean, I think Florida is a mess. <laughs> The, the, the thing, you know, is the broad brush. You all know the way history talk. All the black folk were enslaved and all the white people were. On the whole side. Isn't that basically it? It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. It's just not true. But that's the way it talk. And even now you see it the way the value here is that number one, we have, and he's not the only one. Guess who else really was his right hand man in Georgia? Uh, when he was fighting against slavery. How many people in the Bethels? Are we all Baptists? <laughs> 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 We're going to pray. But, <laughs> but look, his right hand man was John Wesley. John Wesley. He recruited John Wesley to come. And John Wesley was also anti slavery. Same thing happened to him, yeah. happened to Overthorpe. Now, his thing was, let me tell you, and I wrote about this. So John Wesley, young um, evangelist, he got up in a, uh, a scandal, alleged scandal, uh, with Sophia Hopsey, right? And the allegation was that uh, he was dating her, and then she married another man, and he continued to write letters. Uh, after she was married, inviting her, I love this line, come to his own closet at unseasonable hours. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be this is really good stuff, right? Yeah. But, and so that's the prevailing narrative that he was here for just two years and he shook the dust off his feet and he ran, he left and went back to England. Guess who was behind? This campaign, the pro slavery lobby, of course. They didn't like the fact that he was anti slavery. The same people who targeted Overthorpe, what? Targeted him.
Galilee. Yeah. Question for you. Um, all right. He, he or didn't have, didn't want slavery there. He allowed black people, free black people into the colony. The trustee twice tried to allow free black to legally migrate to the colony and parliament and the crown prevented it. They tried twice. But irrespective of that, there were free blacks in the colony. By 1760, there were over 100 free blacks living in Georgia. See, <laughs> yeah, they were here. And the trustees wanted free blacks to come, but the British Attorney General ruled that the prohibition against slaves meant that no Negroes could, quote unquote, migrate to the colony. But regardless, irregardless, black, free blacks were actually here. There were also people violating the prohibition against enslaved blacks too, right? And most of them lived on the other side of the Savannah River. So what they would do, because slavery was prohibited in Georgia up around Augusta, they would bring the enslaved people in and work during the day, and then they would take them back across the river at night. And so the thing about Oglethorpe is he was not perfect. You know, one of the problems we have with American history, Jane, uh, George Washington never did what? Joe and that's the biggest lie ever told, right? Because if you watch the History Channel, one of the things that really led to the American victory is that George Washington was a master of deception. That's what made him so deadly to the British because he was a, a, a master at disinformation, at lying, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> Why would you expect somebody to lie? Are you required to tell your enemy the truth? Yeah, King George, I got like 500 troops and on tomorrow at 3 o'clock. <laughs> Who does that? But I grew up believing that George Washington was. Now we know the lie. Think about all the thought. He was in purple. Right before, after he was elected, right after he came back a war, he rode to go to Parliament. He got into a fight at a house of evil repute about six <laughs> o'clock in the morning uh, with some guy who he said stole a piece of gold and got in the door and he killed him. And the lock over Thorpe up stayed in prison for five, five months. But because his family was kind of, you know, well to do, all of a sudden charges were dropped. He was an imperfect critic of slavery. He wasn't perfect. And guess what I've come to know after 40 years in politics? And it's so helpful to me and took a burden off my shoulder is that the men and women who are supposedly leaders and great folk, they not what? Perfect. Perfect. They're human beings. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In 1983, after I participated in the signing of the peace treaties to end the Revolutionary War, in Versailles and Paris, I went across the English Channel to Godalming, England, oh. and contacted the mayor there, and she took me out to the Oglethorpe Mansion. Imagine. And the thing is, nothing of it is original except one chandelier. <laughs> it was then the home for epileptic women. Mm. But I thought that was very interesting that they wouldn't have kept that as a historical site. Yes, God only. I visited there. And one other little thing you, you, you made me think of something. Did you go, did you stop by the Paris Church of All Saints with the marble plaque that I mentioned? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm in England, right? And I'm with the 57 person delegation. And we're visiting this church, and Oglethorpe and his wife, and Lilith with the beard beneath the floor of the church. And there's a plaque uh, on the wall that Elizabeth had commissioned after Oglethorpe died. She died two years after he died. And she listed all of his accomplishments. He founded Georgia. He fought in the Seven Years' War. Uh, he created legislation to get debtors out of prison. 
and then there's this one eight word passage. He was a friend of the oppressed Negro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they ushered everyone out this 700 year old church. You know, the thing about England, people live in 700 year old house. I mean, you know, but it's a 700 year old church. And I'm standing there in sun setting. He was a friend of the oppressed Negro. To your point. No one ever mentioned that he was a friend of the oppressed Negro. I thought it was a lie. Mm. That's what brought me to hear and hear us this afternoon. Yes, sir. Hey, as uh, interesting as Diallo is, um, your cover there, who, who's a person on the right? Oh, cool. I mean, he's got to be uh, noteworthy as well, I'm guessing. Oh, absolutely. You know, kind of. Dressed up like Prince, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> Prince used to dress that way. That's uh, Equiano, Aladu Equiano. And he was enslaved, uh, captured by African slave raiders, sold uh, through two or three different enslavers, ended up uh, being enslaved by a British uh, captain, and ultimately enslaved by a merchant, a Quaker merchant who used to travel from colony to colony, uh, selling goods to the colonists, the British colonists. He ultimately purchased his own freedom uh, because his own allowed him to sell fruits and vegetables and things during the trip. He freed himself. One day, he's reading a newspaper. And there's a story about the Zong slave ship, Z-O-N-G. And a case is being tried before Lord Chief Justice Manfield, who was one of the most legendary of all British judges and jurists. And the slave was, the, the case was about this. There was a slave ship captain of the Zong, Z-O-N-G. And what people don't know generally is that investors and slave ship owners insured their cargo. So every enslaved person on the ship was insured. Lords of London were basically created to provide insurance for the slave trade. It still exists today, right? Lords of London. That, that. And so this captain, though, all this so they were on this middle passage, and scurvy and disease began to take a toll on the cargo below deck. The enslaved Africans were dying. If enslaved or captive African died at sea, you could collect insurance. If you get to your destination and they die once you make landfall, you can't collect the insurance. So they out 300 miles off course. He came up with a basically an insurance problem. Mm -hmm. And directs his crew to ultimately throw 140 enslaved Africans into the ocean. Mm -hmm. Men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. With the intent of doing what? Collecting mm -hmm. the insurance. So when they get back to land, the owner filed for an uh, insurance property loss claim. The insurer, y'all know how insurance companies are. They said, what? Heck no, we're not going to pay you. It is up in court, an insurance claim. Just like the automobile accident you read about now, it was in court. And the initially, the judge ruled for the slave owner and said, you got to pay, telling the insurance company, you got to pay this claim. They appealed. Equiano reads about it. He goes to this man and said, Mr. Overthorpe, what, what can we do? So this is just pure mass murder. What do we do? Overthorpe says, okay. I know a young lawyer whose name is Grandview Shaw. Go see Grandview Shaw. He's a friend of mine. He's my mentee. 
if we are to when we shall become partners. Ultimately, because that Oglethorpe introduces and mentors Equiano Granville Sharp, these two, Equiano and Granville Sharp, are the primary founders of the formal British abolitionist movement. There was no movement until the Oglethorpe comes up with this idea of putting these two men together, one black, one white. They come up with a, the first abolition society, and it was through that effort, and Wilberforce comes in, and others get involved, and Clarkston, and in about 40 years, in 1833, slavery is about. So that's who this man is. And what's interesting is that our history has never taught us that Oglethorpe had these intellectual relationships with these Black people, that they were sitting and talking and strategizing together. Saw humanity. He saw injustice. He saw bigotry. And he fought against it. And you know, first, slavery was abolished in England in 1833. Right. And then in 1865, it was abolished here in America. But the movement, I submit to you, in large part, at least the formal start, began in 1733 here in the wilderness on the coast of Georgia. And this man played a role in that entire process. Yes, ma'am. Welcome back. Yes, delighted to be back. How are you? Good. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. It's just great. I love the archives. And I, I love Georgia, and I love who we are and who we are. We have become. But you know what? We're better than who we think we are. That's right. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you, as a state, as a people, our heritage, our history, tells me that we are better people than we even that we even dream that we are right now. And hopefully telling this story will encourage us. Think about how much courage it took for this man to take that position, what, 300 years ago? Yes. Uh, he, you know, he came from a wealthy, well-known family. When they say, run back to um, England to face the charges that you know, went away. How did British people feel about that? Well, he became, he was, when he got into his old age, he had the ability to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To remake himself. What, what, what's the word? Reinvent, Reinvent himself. He, re he reinvented himself as this elder statesman, right? And people loved him. <laughs> One of the people who loved him was a lady was Hannah Moore, H A N N A M O R E. She was one of the first uh, female intellectuals, and she was a writer and a poet. And she and Oglethorpe were just totally infatuated with each other. He was in his late eighties. She was beautiful and young, but he understood and respected women intellectuals. He was one of the few men of his age who respected women. Uh, who were educated and intelligent. And she was one of the people, and he inspired her to get involved in the, in the uh, abolitionist movement as well. She wrote this poem. She wrote this poem. This is an amazing poem. And it became a sensation. You know, it's England, right? It's the 18th century. So they don't have like CDs and all that stuff. And she wrote this poem that... Um, but this, she's important to this book. I want you all to see her. White women played a big role in the abolishment of slavery. That's right. Because one of the things, once they set up the abolition society, one of the things they did was they boycotted products made by slave labor. Mm -hmm. White women in England became a big part of this. 
And uh, this is her. You can see that's Hannah Moore. Ooh. Yeah, that's Hannah Moore. And uh, I'll read you a little bit what she wrote uh, to a sister about overthrow. She wrote this, and I wrote the, the beautiful. The beautiful 39-year-old author, Hannah Moore, wrote whimsically to her sister about their relationship. This is what she said. I've got a new admirer, and we flirt together prodigiously. It is the famous General Overthorpe, perhaps the most remarkable man of his time, the finest figure you ever saw. He practically realized all of my ideas of Nestor. His literature is great. His knowledge of the world extensive. And his faculties as bright as ever. He is perhaps the oldest man of a gentleman living. I went to see him the other day, and he would have entertained me repeat by repeating passages of Sir Eldridge. Uh, he's heroic, romantic, and full of old gallantry. <laughs> <laughs> you cool that old oh, no, just, he's just cool. <laughs> and, um, oh, and he was one of the few that supported women intellectuals. And that was a group. They had a group of uh, women intellectuals called the Blue Stockings. And uh, that was just so unique when there was so much uh, chauvinism and misogyny in that part of uh, our history. Yes, ma'am. I'm a native Georgian. And uh, I just recently moved back here maybe five years ago. Tipton, Georgia. Tipton. You know I know Tipton. Yeah. <laughs> um, really um, when did the motto change? And what's the prehistory with the motto change? Because you talked about it being not for self. So yeah. Yeah. But now it's this. Well, you know, technically, and I read this and I got to confirm it. I don't know this Mr. Galloway, but the motto, the modern motto is um, wisdom, justice, moderation. Yeah, but I don't think it's ever officially been adopted. I think it's the motto, but I I read somewhere, and that could have been it could be dated now, and it's never officially been adopted as the state motto. But it's on the seal, wisdom, justice, moderation. Isn't that, uh, 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 there, there is a variation of that that that. If you're at the Capitol, you understand it's it's actually wisdom and justice in moderation. Okay. <laughs> 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 So when they gave their charter back to the king and before they became a crown colony, that was their motto. And they had a business and office downtown London, very close to Parliament. And it's, I'm sure we've been there, the Overclock's house, Georgia Trust, right across the street. So it was all convenient. But they were a corporation when they gave up because they couldn't get their ideals across it. Then, um, We have the copyright on it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's absolutely right. Now, the one thing, see, what I'm, I'm postulating here is that Oglethorpe didn't give up. But that's kind of the history. Oh, they tried it, it failed, it made no sense. It's too idealistic. And that's a book written called Oglethorpe's Folly. And that's been the narrative that to try to create a colony without slavery, you must be out of your mind. It just had to be. Right? No. No. It didn't have to be. And what's so unique is sometimes, and you all know this, the great ideas, the great movements, it takes generations for them to come to fruition. It's not something that always happens. You know, we're into this sitcom mode. You know, it's three commercials and got to get it done by in 30 minutes so we can go to the next show. History is a lot different. And it's over decades and centuries. See, 
slavery existed 400 years. This was 400 years. And the great majority of it was while we were a British colonist in the United States of America. You know, we kind of get a British a little pay at them. But it really was that system. The British created the international slave trade. They, they pioneered it. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I financed it. And it was very, very lucrative. And one thing about the British, and I love my, you know, I, I love them. I've been over there. They document everything and keep it. That I love that, right? And keep it. So if you really want to know about the slave, every, every, every slave and voyage, I mean, in great detail, they do. That's just part of their nature. And something that's three, four, five hundred years old, that's just brand new, right? That's just brand new. So you got a house 500 year old Harvey Lee then, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question about the church. I did not get over to the church. I was on a limited time schedule. I was on a brick rail pass and I went all over England, all the way to the northern part of Scotland at Thurdo yeah. and such and um, didn't uh, get to see everything. But I did get to see the mayor who I had met here in Savannah. Yes. At the, you know, maybe 300, well, no, 250th anniversary of the Battle of Bloody Marsh. Yes. yes. And I do want to thank you for bringing up the idea that slavery was in all those other states too. You know, like you mentioned, New York and Pennsylvania and such, Massachusetts. Connecticut and all of those were slave owning states also. The first colony to codify, to codify the enslavement of black people was New Massachusetts, York. the most liberal of all liberal places. It was Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Things change. People change, right? And no matter where we are today, I'm convinced that if need be, we can change, right? And that's what Overthorpe, that's, and I say this and I'll stop. The subtext of all of this is that Overthorpe became who he was over several decades. He had the ability to evolve and to change. We live in a world now where in politics, number one, even if you're wrong, the last thing you can do is what? Is admit it. <laughs> and if you do admit it, that means you're weak and incompetent. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible world to live in. This is an example of a man who improved himself and evolved himself, who changed himself and ultimately helped change the course of world history. Thank you.